Hi, I'm the Warrior Witch and you can call me Nike. I'm never gonna get sick of that intro. Oh, it's so good. And I'm a little bit offset today because this area is gonna be for visuals and it's gonna block my little deity fam here. So sad, but you know. So this video is gonna be super relevant because we're gonna be talking all about eclipses. Um, so when I release this to the public, it will be actually December 1st, so it'll be the day after the first set of the eclipses. And for patrons, it'll either be Monday, which will be the precise day, or the day before on Sunday, depending on how fast I get this edited. But eclipses in general is what we're gonna be talking about today. Now, some of this is gonna require a little bit of astrological knowledge, but it's nothing that you can't look up. Um, and I will be linking a couple of great resources in the description, so if you need any help, go ahead and look at some of those. But in terms of eclipses, generally people wanna know, like, is it, is it like a supercharged new moon or full moon, or is it something that I can work with? And we'll get to that after we sort of answer how it's gonna affect you, because for everybody, it's gonna be a little bit different, and that's why the visuals are gonna be important. So we can see eclipses astrologically when the sun and the moon are either opposite and close to the nodes or when they are conjunct and close to the nodes. And because they are full moons and new moons, they come in pairs about two weeks apart. So the moon will start opposite the sun down here and it'll rotate around and it'll come up to meet the sun here. Eclipses are not necessarily good or bad technically. Uh, they, they are more just marking great beginnings and great endings. And I, I mean great in the way of like great and terrible, like it could be extraordinarily good or it could be extraordinarily bad. And it will really depend on a lot of circumstances. It will depend on your planetary placements, on the global planetary placements. It'll depend on the houses that they're falling in, in some cases for your country and in for you. Um, we're seeing this some with the US's chart right now. But generally, it will just depend. And that's why when you're doing some of these, you should look back at previous eclipse cycles and kind of see where they're falling in your chart and what was sort of happening around that time. Eclipses also aren't one specific event. They set up a series of events and sort of mark what the next six months will look like for you. So it's not like something has to happen on that exact day, but it more can set up the circumstances for the future. But quite often for a lot of people, it is on that exact day that things happen or right around there in the next you know, few days. And in that six month cycle, usually about three months through so the halfway point, the lunations, the full moon and the new moon will signal a turning point. So right now we're having a Gemini Sagittarius axis eclipse cycle. So we'll have one in Gemini and one in Sagittarius, and that's sort of the, the area of life that'll be falling in. And three months from now, the Virgo Pisces new moon full moon set will be the turning point lunations for this eclipse cycle. As for how it will affect you, this will require that you know your birth time. So you need to know your astrological houses. I use the whole sign house system. So that means that if your ascendant is 15 degrees of Pisces, the entire sign of Pisces from zero to 30 will be your first house and so on for everything. So zero to 30 for every single sign, they're all equal and your ascendant can sit right in the middle. It can sort of float around in any of those. So if you know your rising sign, then you can find the houses that the eclipse is going to fall into. For me, this is my second and eighth house axes. So it's my second house of personal finances and resources and my eighth house of other people's finances, money, sometimes death, taxes, debt, that whole thing. So my money, other people's money, generally money. I'll throw up some charts here so that you can see what each of the house sets will represent. Um, we'll just sort of run through them quickly. So the first house would be self, body, character, appearance. It's very physical, it's very you. It's a very personal house. For the second house, it's finances, possession, income, personal money. The third house is siblings, short distance travel, school, like elementary through high school, sort of your required early schooling, um, and communication in general. Fourth house is parents, home, family, and your private life. Fifth house is children, creativity, pleasure. Some people link adult activities in here, but that's sort of up for debate of which house that falls into. Um, the sixth house is 
illness, injuries, your day-to-day -day tasks and work, or subordinates, those who work under you, or you as an employee. The seventh house is relationships, partner, marriage, or others. Um, so sometimes when eclipses fall on the seventh house, first house axis, you can get stuff happening for your partner, but not necessarily for you. So you can see it happening for that person who is close to you. And the same goes for the fourth house with parents and the third house with siblings. The eighth house is death, inheritance, taxes, other people's money. The ninth house is travel, foreign things, higher education like college and religion. The tenth house is career, your public reputation, how the public perceives you, what you're most known for, and your public actions. Eleventh house is your friends, your community, groups, alliances, and hopes. And the 12th house is enemies, sickness, loss, and seclusion. So rather than day-to-day -day things, it's things that take you away from your daily experiences. So when you have houses, you can sort of look at the opposite. So sixth house being daily tasks and physical health. 12th house can be that which takes you away from your daily tasks or your mental health, those things that make you secluded. So if you know your rising sign and you know the houses that the eclipses are going to fall into, you can kind of look and see what areas of life it might be affecting. It could be both, it could be just one. There's lots and lots of stories. And one of the resources I'll link down below, the Astrology Podcast has a wonderful episode that goes way more in depth about this if you want to learn a lot. They go into a lot of examples, both good and bad. If you want to get into the real nitty gritty of how this is going to affect you, you also need to know something super basic, really easy. Are you a day chart or a night chart? So if you have your time of birth, is your sun below or above the horizon line? So is it in the top half of the chart or the bottom half of the chart? If it's in the bottom half, it's a night chart. If it's in the top half, it's a day chart. It's just the horizon line. Is it above or below? Very easy. Now, if you're a day chart, you want to look at Jupiter and Mars as your two really important planets. And depending on which one of those may or may not be activated or which might be affected by the eclipse axis, that will give you some indication of what it might be involving. If you have both, it's a little of both. Mars would be the planet that is most malefic or most uh, challenging, shall we say, for you, and Jupiter would be the best one for you. Now, the opposite would be for a night chart. So Venus would be your best planet and Saturn would be your hardest planet. I'll actually bring up my chart as an example and I'll just show you some zoom-ins here. Um, my second house, eighth house axis is already showing signs of being really, really good. And actually, as the eclipse was gearing up, I discovered some extra money in my bank account. I got a raise. This eclipse cycle, which usually lasts for one and a half to two years, has been really great for my second house, eighth house axis of finances. In my second house, eighth house axis, I have not just Jupiter, which is my most benefic planet, my most helpful one, but I also have the minor one, uh, the one that will affect me a little less, Venus, up in the top. It's also with my sun, it's my stellium, it's a very, very prominent axis for me. So this axis is really good. Conversely, what I'm not excited for is whenever it ends up being my Virgo Pisces axis because both of the malefics are there. So that means that that may bring me a little bit more trouble when it comes to uh, potentially like friends, family, maybe some creative issues. I'm, I'm not really sure. I'll have to look ahead and do some research on it and uh, sort of figure out what to look for. But that's years down the line. But you can see that immediate difference for me being uh, the benefics and the malefics. For those who know astrology really well and do the traditional astrology stuff with me, um, if the axis falls into your perfection year from your ascendant or your perfection year from your sect light, then that will also depend. If I go by perfections for myself, I am in my second house perfection year, which still indicates great things for me this whole year round in the house of money with the eclipse falling on that axis. So for me, just overall, I have a lot of things falling into that specific axis leading to that. So there's a lot of things that go along with this. And this is the section where I go over some of my personal transits that happened with eclipses and which houses they were in, etc. Um, I'll be using my phone, I'm using the Time Nomad app to go through this and sort of go back in time and look at what was happening and what houses things were going through. Um, if you don't have an iPhone, I believe it's Astro Future you can use, um, but for iPhone users, Time Nomad, for sure. Otherwise, astro.com you can do. It's a little bit harder to sort of move things around, but you can look at your transits through time as well. And if you want to get your chart information, astro.com for sure. June, early June, I believe was the last one this year. Yeah, so the last one was earlier in June, which was a just barely a second house, eighth house axis for me still. Um, 
and that was actually pretty much on the date that the uh, lunations were happening. That is when I posted my Hot Takes uh, Mentors video, and it remains one of my most popular videos here. It got me a lot of subscribers, a lot of attention, and it really helped boost me in an avenue that would eventually be making me money. And within that six month cycle, in late August is actually when I got monetized, which was a big turning point for me. And if we go to August, I believe it was the 28th or the 30th or something like that. It was pretty late in the month, maybe the 26th. So I got monetized then, but it took a couple days to kick in. So the lunation, about three months later, September 2nd, that was the full moon. And so that was the big turning point for me for getting monetized and having the ability to actually see the revenue coming in. My AdSense had kicked in. And so for me, the second house, eighth house axis of money and finances was taking a big turning point in making the video that was popular at the start of the eclipse cycle, start earning money halfway through. So very early in 2019, like right in January was when I had made the official decision to move for school and pretty much to the day of the lunar eclipse, I'm getting that one right. Um, pretty much to the day of the lunar eclipse was when I had gotten my acceptance letter for school um, and it was an eclipse cycle in my ninth house, third house axis, which is schooling. And especially specifically with the moon being across for me in my ninth house, it's higher education, it's college. And so it, it was the last one of my third house, ninth house axis um, for the past you know two or three years where I'd been trying to focus on school. Uh, it was just the sort of culmination of now you're going to be moving away for school and then in the next eclipse cycle for the thing that's going to make you money. So this is when I got accepted um, and then I moved with a job lined up and for the schooling to get me a career. And then the last significant one I remember from before that because you know there are fuzzy times in everybody's memory but uh, a significant event was happening in 2017 which was really notable for me. Um, I had been broken up with at the very, very end of June, like June 30th. The next eclipse happened early, early August, um, and that was my 10th house and 4th house axis, so like private life and reputation, and it was a very tumultuous time for me. So I can kind of see this one being more chaotic for me. Um, from that time, that's where things really started to deteriorate. I was just in a really, really bad place after that breakup, um, and I can see this really prominently in the astrology because Mars, which is my most malefic planet because I have a day chart, is co-present with the Sun and with the, the North Node, so it's right on that eclipse axis with the other planets, and it really, really makes that prominent, that my most malefic planet would be part of that eclipse, and that eclipse was really, really hard for me. Comparing that with this eclipse cycle, I don't have any malefics near me, I don't have any of that to worry about, so everything seems to be pretty smooth sailing for me at this time. So when we're looking around at some of those, you can see which planets really start affecting things as you start looking back and as you start sort of putting all these pieces together. It's really complicated at first to start really synthesizing all these pieces together, but just take it step by step, break it down. You can even make a list, it's what I do sometimes, so I'll just go down the list. So uh, what is your rising sign? What house is the eclipse happening in? So that would be the Gemini Sagittarius houses. Um, are you a day chart or a night chart? And depending on which of those answers you give, what are your malefic and benefic planets and where are they in relation to this? So for me, it would be I'm a Scorpio rising. It is happening in my second and eighth houses. I'm a day chart. So I would look at Jupiter and Mars. Where are they? Are they affecting anything? Are they on these axes, etc.? It's a good look ahead, and for those concerned about really bad placements, um, if you have, like I had that one year, uh, Mars, my most malefic, right on the eclipse axis, and everything seemed to be going pretty poorly, um, about three months later was when I started getting some relief. So you tend to get relief about three months later from that point, and the eclipse cycle won't last forever. So just Buckle down, do your shadow work, do your protections, take care of yourself, mental health is important, uh, and just know that it won't last forever. All bad things will pass. All good things will pass too, but it sounds nicer to say all bad things will pass. Now, the question that a lot of people in the witch community get a lot, especially if they do anything with astrology, is can I use the eclipses for spell work? I heard it's like a super full moon or a super new moon. Is that a good time to do stuff? What should I do? Can I use it? How can I use it? What should I do? You know. Uh, my advice is generally don't use it, um, which may sound really upsetting because, you know, you might have this conception in your head that it's this like super powerful thing and all of my spells will work super well now and I'll become super powerful, which 
no. Um, the, the exception would be if you've studied astrology enough and you can look back at these cycles to know how these things have affected you in the past, what sort of events have happened for you during these similar cycles. If you're old enough, um, I believe the number is about every 19 years you'll get the same cycle over again. So if you're old enough to be able to look back at your life 19 years ago and see what was happening on those eclipse dates, maybe you could work with it if it was good things then. Um, but you also have to look at the planetary configurations now and where the benefics and the malefics are falling. Unless you really know astrology, I really wouldn't recommend doing like big important spell work on the eclipses, either on the lunar eclipse or the solar eclipse, like both of them. Because if you don't know how to read the chart stuff and you don't know how to understand what all of that means, you might be stumbling into something you're not prepared for. And it could be really good, but it also could be really bad. I mean, there are stories of... Um, in Chris Brennan's podcast, somebody comes up to the mic because they're doing like a public uh, group meeting thing, and they're talking about like all of the eclipses that have fallen into their various houses, and there have been two pretty great uh, opposite ends examples of we'll go with the second house, eighth house axis, because we've been talking about it. Money finances other people's money. Um, so the eighth house can also involve death. Um, and so one of the examples was somebody who uh, had a mentor that died and their life sort of got thrown into turmoil so it involved the death of another person um, but a different person who had a second half ace ha but a different person who had a second half a different person who had a second house eighth house axis eclipse they found their dream job and made a lot of money for it and got raises and like we're going through a really, really financially prosperous time in their life. So, you know, if you take these two examples, you compare the death of someone who you care for very deeply or getting a bunch of money. If you don't know the planetary placements that could indicate more which one those could be, or if you're not fully aware of the possibility of negative versus positive consequences, you just don't want to be messing with that energy because you don't know which energy you could be invoking. If you're looking to draw power, but you're making the death of a loved one more powerful, that's obviously really bad. Um, there are things like finding a new place to live or getting kicked out. You know, that it's, it's big big beginnings and big endings. It's kind of like in my tarot video where I talk about the tower and how the tower isn't necessarily good or bad, but it's chaotic and it's big and it's massive energy. And if you don't know how to harness that massive energy, it's just gonna seem all bad to you. And it could be good, but without being able to harness it properly, it just more, le more than likely ends up being bad. So that's just a brief overview of eclipses. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed. It's really, really complicated to sort of get into a lot of it. And I will eventually be doing a either one singular intro to astrology video or maybe a series. I'm not quite sure yet. Um, but if you want to know more about the style that I'm learning, it is Hellenistic astrology. It's, it's very traditional. Um, and the people that I'm learning from, uh, they source from people from way back when, like ancient Greece and Egypt and the Middle Ages and, you know, just like throughout history. The centuries, literally, of astrology knowledge that have been gathered and studied. I'm going more the traditional route, so when I end up doing those videos, they will be more from that perspective. Um, the biggest difference there being like some of the rulerships. So Scorpio would not be ruled by Pluto, it would be ruled by Mars, etc. But, you know, if you guys are interested, I will be doing those in the future. I don't know if it'll be one just sort of broad overview or more breaking it down piece by piece, uh, but we'll be doing that in the future. Hope you guys enjoyed. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next time. So, blessed be.